Hey guys, and welcome back to Digital Artcast. Um, another episode coming back at you in these uh, troubling times. Um, but of course, I'm here to ease your pain and give you something to listen to while you're uh, doodling, drawing, uh, making 3D art, whatever you're doing. Um, shout out to all the guys that we recently found out are listening from all over the states um i hope you guys are doing well with us as well it's it's a troubling time but of course um we will persevere we've been through worse and we will definitely get through this now um today uh, i managed to haul in an artist that i have been trying to talk for a while as as most amazing artists are trying to get this podcast are always so busy um but this particular artist just took some time out of his weekend schedule to come and chat to us about um his career Um, his findings about his life as a studio artist and of course freelance now Um, today we are talking to Mr Henry Wong hello Henry hey how's it going Gordon yeah good man good yeah we were uh we were kind of talking a little bit earlier just before we started recording about the whole situation in London and stuff Mm -hmm. and and, uh, but an interesting time for you also because um how long ago did you go freelance now uh I've been freelance for about maybe five to four months now maybe a little longer yeah pretty recent then yeah, so you, recent. You, you kind of picked a good time to go freelance yeah maybe yeah. i don't know yet <laughs> yeah i've got well i mean in the general sense of you know the the way the world is at the moment oh yeah, home, yeah work from home yeah, so. I'm, I'm super prepared yeah you're already kind of already in that mindset so um so yeah so um we've known each other a couple of years now mm-hmm. um i think their first introduction to each other was i mean i think i actually met you in digital workshops 2016 but it was a more just yeah. passing hey yeah. how's it going and nothing but then the first time i think we actually sat and talked for more than like five minutes was when we played magic the gathering at 2018 in workshops yeah yeah that that definitely was yeah we played magic yeah i had a couple of decks with me and uh people were kind of laughing saying um like oh i bet you didn't bring any i just like whipped out all these magic decks and they're like oh (laughs) shit we can play so yeah i think it was me you york and a couple other guys my friend adam so it was quite fun great time um but then of course I've, i've kept on top of your career um which has just been going in strides and of course we all know how amazing you were and then of course you took the leap now you're you're oh, you're freelance you. you're doing your own thing so um yeah you're doing well man and um, definitely awesome to see you flourishing in the industry um of course even you know back up as you were working on some amazing projects as well and even before that as well so you know you've had a you definitely had a, a full career <laughs> I'm, at this been, point. I'm trying i'm trying my best yeah honest. yeah you're doing I'm well, just... man. <laughs> just yeah. guessing my way through <laughs> no 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 but then of course uh you also like a lot of people have taken interest in your morn-ups so your your warm-ups that you do like mm-hmm. every morning um you paint uh or you know do a study from uh i think these are just from still images that you find online or images you've taken yourself or... yeah yeah a bit of everything yeah right okay yeah so i mean like it's like almost like an online plein air but uh but yeah you're you've done them consistently now for like since you went freelance or even before that? Oh, before that, I think right. maybe uh, fully consistently about three years now, perhaps. Wow. Yeah. Okay. You're, you're kind of getting like, uh, uh, is it Beeple? He's kind of got Oh, those, yeah, uh, yeah, Beeple. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gets like those, like those dailies every single day. And I think he's not missed one in like something crazy, like nearly 10 years or something. He's been doing like dailies and he's never, ever, you know, not posted something at mm-hmm. least once a day. So, um, but yeah, again, I think that, these consistencies or these things you're doing every day are things also train you just to be um, more disciplined by you know just making sure you're working every day or doing one task and posting it and keep it in the loop and so is that something that you were doing like way back before you would even post them online were you still doing warm-ups every morning or yeah I was trying to just because uh you know when I first started as a um an intern at Opus Arts and even at when I was doing my master's um in character animation i kind of sucked as an artist I, like i didn't know anything um because i started off with a traditional art background like but mostly because uh, i was doing um, life drawing um because i was studying a fine art course and they weren't really teaching us like how to draw or anything they were like it was more like conceptual uh, contemporary art um it's more about theory than uh, actual practice of art so the only person who taught me how to draw was um, a guy called Martin Brooks, um, who actually sh- displays his paintings at the National uh, Portrait Gallery um, every year. Um, he's really, really good. Um, but he taught me how to do some like, you know, life drawings and stuff. And that's pretty much all I knew. I didn't even know how to use like Photoshop when I first started. And um, so I, I had to like get better for, you know, the school and for the studio. So I had to 
you know, try to learn as cram as much stuff as I could every day. But uh, I know that I was so time restricted. So I gave myself 30 minutes to an hour every day just to learn something new. Uh, cool. Just trying my best. Yeah. Nice. Nice, man. Yeah. But then, of course, um, kind of going back to the origins, because when you're talking about your master's, I mean, yeah. I, I even had the same opportunity. I had a once I finished my, my degree, my honours degree in 3D animation, I had the opportunity to maybe go and do a master's at Glasgow School of Art. Mm -hmm. But then I felt like that was just taking a step more towards academia than mm -hmm. just practical learning. So how did you get into art originally? I mean, I'm assuming you, you kind of painted and drew as a kid, but then was that something you followed into college, university? Were those steps like consciously taken from high school the way that like, you wanted to be an artist? Uh, yeah, I, I think I always wanted to sort of be like a comic book or a, co a manga artist but i just really oh, didn't know how to get into to get there the, yeah because yeah. I, I was i'm from like a kind of like a smaller city in england called plymouth okay in the southwest in devon nice. and um i didn't really have any connections um a lot of the courses weren't really offering me a route into it but i just sort of took a blind guess and yeah uh just try 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 to get into it but you know, mm. when I first tried it, it was just more academic based art. Right. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. It just really wasn't my thing. It wasn't until I got into my master's course at um, what was it called Central Saint Martins that I kind of mm. had a better idea. But quite literally, if I didn't get into Central Saint Martins, I was thinking about going to like Thailand, to become mm. a Muay Thai fighter or something oh, nice. crazy <laughs> like that. Because I was in my early twenties and right. didn't have any clue what i was doing <laughs> yeah i think the the fighting aspect would have been cool as well because even back then that would have been almost like on the cusp of mma you know and the ufc kind of just building out and being a thing mm. so um yeah that could have also been a career but then i think it's interesting where the more people i've listened to who have had fighting careers i've all said you know they've had to get out at one point because mm -hmm. you can only get kicked in the head so many times yeah and then i gotta keep just... my brain cells right now <laughs> but, oh yeah i mean like even i mean joe rogan was talking to kevin smith because he was on at one point and he was always like right. oh yeah you know would you have know what to get in the ufc and he was like if it was like 10 years ago maybe even 20 years ago yeah sure but then mm -hmm. he was talking about when he was training and he was doing like some local fights because joe rogan's been fighting since he was like like 10 or something like he's, yeah. he done like judo jiu-jitsu all that kind of stuff um but then he was saying like he was getting to points where you know he was starting to get a bit hazy and then he mm -hmm. was talking to people who were older than him that had been fighting for longer and like a lot of the guys couldn't like tie their shoelaces so he was like yeah. oh shit you know like i need i need to think about doing something else because this is this is this isn't going to be lasting very long anyway so um and i'm sure your family were also giving you props not a yeah, probably. That also. <laughs> yeah. I would have been a ultimate stereotype because my parents own like a um, a Chinese takeaway or takeout, and uh, okay. they would have made me work there, and then I would have been like doing martial arts and teaching martial arts on the side. Oh, okay, like, yeah, oh, my yeah. Goodness. <laughs> are they uh, are they originally from mainland China? Uh, yeah, they're they're from the the south. Um, from, okay, uh, Guangzhou and stuff. So. Interesting. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Um. So yeah, I mean. That would have been great doing your master's and then did you almost have the ability to do a phd then as well was that something you were considering or uh at a certain point i was thinking about doing a phd but i just really like, i thought it was a good idea just because i think my parents have always told me to get like the highest degree you can um but in my heart i was just like i knew uh, yeah i mean, acad I mean academic of. arts isn't you know, bullshit. Oh, wait, can I swear in this podcast? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fucking go for it, man. That oh, yeah. Swear all you want. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I was like, oh, <laughs> no, it's all PG. good. It's all good. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just, you know, I just thought it was a bit bullshit, to be honest. And um, yeah. So, and I, I was more interested in the practical side. So I just was totally yeah. against it. And at the time, mm. I was, I think I was interning at Opus. And the more I was right. learning about concept art and the more I was doing uh, animation, I was, realizing that um there's just so much more to learn right practical art and was much more interesting and fulfilling interesting than i you. felt yeah and uh, yeah. academic art yeah i feel like um the old motto of those who can't do teach does stand the test of time a lot of people i've came across in academia mm -hmm. um there is exceptions like i have met people where um you know like yeah brian Locke, one of the guys i know from Aberté university in dundee yeah. um he was down in the workshops a couple of years i used to catch up with him every year there and he would mostly go down not just for himself but also so when he came back to teach he was very aware of 
this is what you should be you know putting in your in your portfolio um i think he even actually helped a couple of people get into access at the time when i was interning there mm -hmm. um the Aberty guys who were coming in had had a lot of information from ryan um so yeah there is there is definitely exceptions but yeah the vast majority of people um i went to school with or was taught by had never had any industry i mean perfectly nice people and yeah. really great teachers but yeah they didn't have any idea about you know stuff like even simple stuff like what is art station you know and mm -hmm. you know how to teach concept or how to do 3d to an industry standard a lot of the stuff that people were getting a's for in the school um was stuff that you know was nowhere near what needed to be for a, even a junior level and i think that's a very consistent yeah. thing i've heard through people i've spoke to even alex Beddows we had in recently and he mm -hmm. was saying the same when he speaks to students it's very apparent that when people leave university there's a huge skills gap that needs to be filled really quickly for people to get work so um, but then you were coming were you coming straight out of university any opas uh yeah pretty much because i was um doing i was like a part-time intern i was doing like once or twice a week whilst okay. i was studying my two-year uh, ma course okay so uh, by the end of my uh, ma course you know I, mm -hmm. I asked the boss um uh just like oh you know would you hire me and he was just like i don't know and then i was like, oh. I, was like I was like pretty, pretty please and he's yeah. like oh, yeah, i guess yeah um, oh that's nice man yeah, yeah. no because i heard um when i'm talking to heath at one point he was talking about kind of his road in and you know just kind of meeting people at the right time and having a sketchbook with them and then they kind of brought him over and yeah. had a couple of tests and stuff but then it was great that you had something straight out of your masters that you could just um go straight into because you were there for um how long were you there now a couple of years right yeah so i was class? two years as an intern and then i was three years as a professional artist at uh, okay. Opus arts yeah right yeah and then you would have worked on multiple projects i'm assuming division being one of them that was probably one of the biggest i think projects you guys had at the time right was was division that was like yeah 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 thing. that's that's one of the biggest projects uh we did the mm -hmm. first division and then the um i think they had a big patch called like 1.8 i worked right. on that as well cool, um, cool. and yeah no, and then just did a bit bunch of other projects like the uh, elder scrolls and mm -hmm. um worked on a game called crackdown 3 but i can't show anything so yeah, yeah um yeah. but that didn't uh, you know that didn't do yeah of course well. yeah no. no there was there was uh <laughs> they were still doing i know when i was at um when i was at axis um back in the day they were doing some crackdown stuff and uh, mm -hmm. and yeah um destiny and whatever else but yeah i think actually i'm pretty sure that still is done by a scott studio i think the guys are still up here but yeah i don't know what had happened since because i know we both know that crackdown didn't do super well so mm -hmm. um I it's a shame i love the game uh, the original yeah i think the, the concept games. behind it was really good so yeah it was it was a shame that um i think it just maybe even came out at the wrong time or didn't have enough momentum because i think it was it was getting put off for ages and ages and it was never coming out and then eventually it came out and yeah not too so anyway so yeah so loads of projects and and mm -hmm. you were doing work there and and you know doing your thing so what was the kind of thinking behind you were wanting to leave and go be freelance was that just a, a call that you wanted to try and push yourself outside your comfort zone or was there a project that was kind of calling you at the time that you couldn't really do as part of opas or yeah so uh opus arts was um you know they were kind enough that um while you're working there you can pursue other projects and um mm -hmm. on the side so you could do freelance work um because i know a lot mm -hmm. of studios whilst you're working for them uh, mm -hmm. you're not allowed to you know uh, indulge other, other projects or so yeah. that would be like some sort of weird infringement i don't know it, it seems weird to me but um they were nice enough for you know us to look out for other projects outside of opus arts if we really wanted to is mm -hmm. it was you know it, it is hard work because you're doing eight hours in the studio and then you're more yeah. or less going back home you know eating showering and then pretty much jumping on a project for like three or four hours before bed and then right um but yeah um there's quite a few reasons i suppose i guess i wanted to challenge myself a lot more um i, I just really wanted to see what i could do as an artist i at a certain point i felt uh, I, I was a little stagnating um, as a professional mm. artist at the studio. Um, you know, I, I really loved the studio. Um, they, they gave me everything I have now. Yeah. Um, but I felt like I just wasn't really growing. I wasn't really seeing much of the world. I wasn't really putting myself at a, um, how do you say it? Like, not, is it a disadvantage or a handicap? Yeah. Like, I, I needed to yeah. see what I, I could do myself without someone giving me training wheels. 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of things like that. And, uh, I, yeah. Yeah. And, I, and plus, I wanted to be more flexible with my time. Like, London commute was absolutely yeah. killing me. You could be, you know, on average, I was spending anywhere between two to three hours every day on commute. Oh, wow. Um, and, you know, especially on rush hour, it's just, yeah, it just takes a yeah. drain on you. So I was just like, you know, I, I want to be more flexible with my time. I want to concentrate on my health. I want mm-hmm. to do things, projects that, you know, maybe they'll be good, maybe they'll be bad. It doesn't matter. I just wanted to know that I could do jobs outside of my comfort zone. Yeah, and, something uh, that would expand your horizons and yeah, make yeah. you think about differently. But then are you, so you're in, are you in central London at the moment? Are you about outside of it or? Uh, so, so I kind of live in the uh, south of London, like near Brixton, okay. sort of area, yeah. Right. Okay. So you're kind of more or less in the heart of, of yeah, the pretty much. Yeah. 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 Um. So I, I mean, since you've took on freelance stuff, I mean, you've kind of announced maybe not the projects you're working on, but you have announced like the people you're working with. So, mm-hmm. um, you're currently working with Action Studios. Um, yeah. you're doing stuff for Netflix. Um, was there anybody else? I'm trying to remember. But those uh, are the kind there's of Chromosphere. Um, okay. Ardman Studios. Okay. Interesting. And, yeah. Uh, Airbnb and. Um, oh cool yeah yeah interesting, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> um so so it's all conceptual stuff you're doing for them as well kind of the same kind of stuff you're doing at, at Op- opus or a bit uh <laughs> um, well not specifically what you're drawing or making but like the, the 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 practice behind it is you're physically drawing things for them uh it's it's a bit of everything actually um this is one thing that i found really good about doing warnups and having a social media presence is that uh-huh. um when you put out more and more things online, especially uh-huh. um, certain style or maybe just uh-huh. concentrate on environments or characters, it doesn't matter really. Um, yeah. It seems like certain types of clients would start to approach you um, right, as you okay. get more and more known. And um, that's actually how I got most of these uh, gigs is that people saw what I was doing. I, right. I was posting daily. I, I was co- sort of creating myself a presence. Right. And um, a lot of these, uh, you know, studio uh, production managers. Uh, right. We're seeing this. You know, art directors were seeing this and they were like, perhaps this guy could, you know, help introduce something into, I don't know, game something weird, dude. or animation yeah. or whatnot um, into right. and then, um, you know, uh, right. create something cool with us. Um, so that's Yeah, because you're doing, especially with the guys you're working with, right? It's less like game focused. That's more animation production focused then uh to be honest at the moment i've been getting a bit of everything which is really good um keeping cool. my brain quite uh, active yeah. yeah quite active quite fresh i i've had to try to problem solve a lot more uh, cool. whilst i was at opus we mostly concentrated on uh, video games we didn't really right. do too much uh movies or films or animation and since right. going freelance i seem to get a bit more uh so animations or gigs and um it's, it's been sort of really cool really nice in that side of the production right yeah is that something you prefer do you think now that you've done a lot of kind of bit of that now do you prefer the animation stuff to the game stuff or do you more like the game stuff or uh to be honest i actually like them both uh it's okay. a bit greedy of me to say but uh, no, no. yeah, yeah. I, I just really enjoy both the aspects i just find them so yeah. interesting and I don't know if you preferred even just the, the, the pipeline to one over the other or the way that you found or problem solved differently was maybe better um, or more thought through in animation as opposed to game stuff. Um, I know people sometimes work in games for a couple of years and because they're kind of done the same way and have been done the same way for a long time, people can get a bit dry on those uh, pipelines and productions and they want to try and do something a bit different. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it just depends. on. But it depends again on... The upbringing of where you've worked previously mm-hmm. and, and what you've done um so that, yeah, that would be really interesting. i didn't get that much of a problem i guess um because uh, opus arts was a uh, outsourced company we had to take on a, a variety of clients at the time so right. you know styles and um could change from one project to another and you have to you know you'd be one 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 project in the morning and in the afternoon you'd be on a different project with a completely different style or yeah. look and yeah. you had to do that constantly. And the next day, it'll be another client with a different style and look. So um, yeah. I, I, was, I sort of, you know, just, you know, I, it isn't too bad to put the switch for like changing styles and uh, right. like how I problem solve um, 
be sort yeah. of uh, yeah issues. you're still kind of doing the same things just in a different setting or a different environment yeah so, i've been sort yeah. of trained to you know deal with the situation and yeah, yeah of course it's all right i think a lot of design in general is problem solving i mean even when i've looked into mm-hmm. you know recently some uh user interface stuff you know you're still kind of doing the same thing you're still trying to solve a, a visual problem that mm-hmm. needs to be addressed so um and i think that's also you know why access appeals to well, studios like access appeal to yeah. people because the projects are so varied um you know when i was there they were working on you know a, a slew of different stuff that all had different styles artistically and different mm-hmm. style approaches and you know there was some tv stuff some game stuff so it was all you know you could work there for one year and work with like you know maybe 10 different clients that all had yeah. different premises so it was that i think that's why that kind of stuff even opus will have the same thing you know where you work on such varied things but a game there probably more game focused um whereas access is taken on you know also stuff from tv film right whatever right. so yeah so i mean now that you've been working from home for a mm-hmm. couple of months um i'm assuming you're not going star crazy i'm assuming you're still no tired. no i i, yeah. I love uh, staying at home yeah awesome man so is that because then you're getting the, the best of both worlds where you're getting to work on projects but if you want to stop and go to the gym or do a bit of training then that's no as big an ask and again you've not got the commute so you're you're rescuing a couple hours each day from your mm-hmm. schedule um so i take it that's is that something maybe i mean it might be too early to ask but then again with this quarantine we don't know but um is is freelance something you think you could see yourself doing in the long run uh like for now i i think i i wouldn't mind just just doing freelance i haven't particularly gone like crazy just talking to myself yet so right yeah um, <laughs> I, I think the most important aspect of just working freelance is that um you just sort of have to have a regimented timetable i even though i say that um you know i, I just sort of do whatever every day um, i just make sure that yeah. i clock in like at least you know uh eight hours a day maybe eight to ten hours right. a day uh working uh, whether it's on like one or two projects and then yeah. making sure that I have time to, you know, exercise, stretch, go to the gym, do my grocery right. shopping. Of course. Um, yeah. It, it's just making sure that you follow like a strict routine and making sure that you get everything done every day. Cause it, it's really right. easy when you work at home, you just procrastinate. You're just like, ah, oh, your work gets done. I'll yeah. just do it later, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's just important just to make sure you, everything gets you know, sort it in the beginning and then and then it makes your life a lot easier than just guessing your day through. Yeah, because we, um, at the time of recording this, previously we spoke to Max Berman about his mm-hmm. article on tips from working from home. Um, and of course, he's been doing it kind of consistently for years mm-hmm. while he was doing film production stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so is there anything you feel like, I mean maybe not just stating the obvious, but maybe even something particularly you found that has helped you work from home or helped you be consistent. I mean, I'm assuming your mourn-ups are part of that. Yeah. That's something that will be helping you make sure that your your brain is switched on to working at the start of the day. Um, is there anything else you find that you do every day that kind of helps push you along? Uh, coffee. Know, coffee. Coffee definitely oh, coffee, helps. Course, Stretching yeah. helps. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mostly that, to be honest. Uh, my wife helps. Uh, oh, okay. She's the one that usually boots me out of bed when I decide <laughs> to sleep. And um, so it must be a terrible marriage if yeah, she's kicking you in bed. Yeah, in I think uh, <laughs> having a good support system in place and yeah. making sure you have a routine helps. Um, breaking yeah. breaking routines is um, usually something that uh, kind of screws people over because then it, it's hard to get back into a routine. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. But so Almost impossible, yeah. Yeah, so um, kind of like going to the gym, I suppose. Like as long as you know that you got to do two or three days at a gym, right? Or you know, two or go for a run or whatnot. Uh, yeah. As long right. as you know you got to do, you got to hit that target for the week, right? And uh, you know, it it helps makes it easier for next week and then the week after and the week after because you're just setting like it. I, I guess your your brain just knows that you you sort of like um it's sort of like a comfort zone like just daily routines yeah. feel good and if you do it enough then your brain's just like yeah this is this is normal and, yeah i uh, think consistency yeah. is key in most things we do because it is very easy to um switch off and think that oh you know i can deal with that thing later um i think the immediacy keeping on top of things is what keeps you consistent because it's 
it's too easy to fall into those patterns of just not wanting to do anything. I think the hardest thing is being consistent and staying on task and, you know, getting your exercise in every day, making sure you're eating regularly and healthy, making sure that you're going for regular walks or standing up and, you know, obviously on top of that, try to study things. So I, I think it's it's definitely, I found that this career is one of the hardest I think I've found on the planet at the moment, especially working in entertainment it is such a demanding industry. But then it also takes a toll mentally on people because you do have to sacrifice so much of yourself and time to make sure that you stay employed and stay yeah, relevant. Yeah. So, um, and I, talking about that as well, with social media, mm-hmm. have you found that, I mean, you talk about, you know, you've probably got work from your morn-ups and, and that's definitely been consistent. Is there any other benefits you've seen to having a daily presence online apart from just work? Uh, I guess uh, connections. I, I start mm-hmm. to know a lot more people from um, you know around the world, like LA and, and mm-hmm. Montreal, and even around right. Europe. Um, yep. it, it helps knowing more and more artists around the world, and, and then you soon you realize like how small the art community is. Like there, there are thousands of super talented people like who are way better than me, but you realize <laughs> just how small the world is, and yeah, and um, you know everyone has you know the same insecurities and the same uh, yep. love and interest and it's really cool to sort of knowing these people um just through social media and you sort of you're sort of able to set like kind of like a goals or a yeah. bar to obtain um, yeah of course when you talk to these people and even and you might even become like great friends with them as well so of course um yeah and uh, you know through social media I've become you know relatively good friends with a lot of these artists and we yeah. change tips or files and ideas and stuff yeah i think it's also good because it does also help i think we just mental stimulation and motivation because when mm-hmm. you see other people you know uh you see other people doing that other things that are like you know regular or daily or, or things that are getting published with these great projects mm-hmm. and you know, it does also encourage you to be like, oh shit, well, you know, I need to push myself because they're doing really well. It's like, I think, yeah. um, you know, when you would have been at Opus, you know, working and stuff because you would have had people kind of the left and right of you um, and you're seeing what they're working on. Also, you're also like, oh shit, right. Okay. I need to now, you know, meet, meet them or, or surpass them or equal them. Um, yeah, yeah, I think definitely. that's why social media is a good thing for that. But then also it's, it's a double-edged sword, right? You've got to try and also not lose yourself on social media and become, mm-hmm addicted in a sense or, yeah, or of course. relying on it so have you down have you found there's a balance you've got to have do you kind of maybe even you know put your phone on silent for most of the day do you try to kind of keep away from it in emails and stuff yeah I, I try to well at least i'm trying to um at least turn off my phone during the evenings and stuff just because mm-hmm. it's really addicting just to watch that light count just go up mm-hmm. it's, it's uh it's just that you know that dopamine that you get just from it, like just people liking your stuff and right uh, it gives you uh i guess it's kind of like a false ego sort of thing it's, it's right like you just get like a slight ego from it you just gotta check yourself every once in a while just like, yep like you know just make sure you stay humble make yep. sure you don't go crazy from social media and stuff um yeah yeah i mean I think, I think, especially yeah. like what what you were talking about a moment ago like um, when i started doing this morning ups it was definitely because uh, you know, i was working with super talented artists at the time you know, um, you know, I worked with a friend called uh, Felix ba- uh, Bauer, who mm-hmm. currently working at uh, EA, I think, or uh, uh-huh. uh, was it Criterion? Uh, Criterion okay, EA. Yeah. Uh, Alex Heath, you know, my friend Alex Heath, um, working for Riot and Magic. Uh, yeah. Daniel Matthews, who, you know, worked on the latest, uh, was it Captain the, Marvel or something? Yeah, he's a trickster now in, in Germany, right? Yeah, now, yeah. Like... And, you know, these people are just, oh, and then my friend uh, Quentin, who's mm-hmm. working as an art director at Toei Animation. So these people right. were like right next to me every day, just being you know, super talented artists. And I'm just like checking myself like, oh my God, like how, how yeah. do I compare to these guys? Yeah. Uh, so this is the whole reason why I was starting to do these more ups because I realized like the reason why they're so good is because, you know, they, they got the basics down. They, they understand color, they understand perspective and yeah. uh, all, all sorts of uh, the basic aspects of just painting and mm-hmm. um, designing and illustration so i had to really push myself and um, posting every day also was like kind of get all it, it's a thing that comes with like a lot of new artists right even see actually even the, like a lot of senior artists get this as well is that um is the the perfection aspect is that 
they can right. only post things that are done per- perfect yeah. things that they know is just like you know it's really hard hard to like scrutinize their work or they think yeah. there's no flow in it but yeah, um, no. my idea is just me posting every day just show you know hopefully i show that i'm like a human being that like you know not every daily warm-up i do is perfect uh, right. sometimes i do crappy ones sometimes i'm just doing something that's completely abstract or i'm just mm. testing out new brushes or ideas or software yeah. uh, or just something cool i saw or maybe i'm just playing with like color dynamics or something um, yeah. it's just it's just to get over that perfection aspect and just post things show that i'm you know a flexible person but i i'm able to evolve also yeah. i'm doing all these weird um, worn up drawings and stuff yeah. but then that's <laughs> it's not going to help of course when you get really cool articles on 80 level when people are featuring you and then you get uh random internet dicks um saying that you're basically just copying photos i mean like oh yeah I don't know. yeah <laughs> no, I was, if, if you guys don't know there was uh so henry recently had a, an 80 level article featured on him about his, his worn ups and and uh they were covering his whole process and one of the top comments was uh i think there was only maybe three comments on the whole thing but one of the guys was like oh yeah you know I've, i talked about people doing concept art and how hard it's good to be but this guy's you know he's just adjusting these photographs and photoshop with a filter and he's not even really drawing this stuff is terrible and of course like <laughs> i just couldn't like control myself and i had to go and post and i was like you, like you little shit fucking uh, <laughs> like, I think so. the fact you said about Henry, this guy's talented you don't even know what you're talking about but uh yeah, man, it's difficult when, because uh, like I said, again, the social media is a double-edged sword. Yeah, right? You've got course, the, yeah. the post stuff and you feel good, but then, of course, there's people, sometimes you're posting who aren't artists, who don't know the industry, and mm-hmm. um, will just try to tear you down. And, and uh, I mean, it's sometimes it's, I mean, I think, I think I go in extremes where, you know, I either have way too much of it or, like, if I go cold turkey, yeah. um, I start to get withdrawals. But then it's difficult when you look at, um, I remember there was a recent study I just watched that was only a couple of days ago where someone talked about uh, social media or your phone in general is seen as something that can actually be um, um, compared to alcoholism where, you know, oh, yeah. like if, you put, if you put your phone down, like, you know, and you walk away from it, like how long would you walk away from your phone before you start twitching or you're like, oh, I need to check it. I need to, I need to pick up my phone up. I need yeah. to check it. Yeah, like it's, it's just so ingrained, I think, in people's uh, daily routines mm-hmm. that it's hard to now think about like a life without your phone. Um, so it's it's a definitely something I think everybody now, especially like people my age where, you know, like I'm 34 just now and, mm-hmm. you know, I grew up, you know, 2009 and that, like when social media was starting to just become a thing, you know, I've grown up with it as it's basically became a thing. And, and I think that's why sometimes it's hard to see the effects or, or be very aware of them going in, you know, with open eyes because mm-hmm. it's so new, you know, we don't really know the full extent of right. what this is doing to us. But then I think now we're seeing that, the biggest trend with social media is that there is more depression in the world. People are very, very aware of their bodies, mm-hmm. their career, their partners or whatever, you know, because it's social media tends to only show like the the most perfect side of people or yeah. the most perfect side of art. Even people, you know, who might be looking at your morn ups every morning thinking, oh my God, this stuff's incredible and I'm never going to be that good. But then yeah. they don't see like the, you know, the almost 10 year journey you've had from, going to school and interning and working on projects and yeah. sitting every night trying to practice like they only see the tip of the iceberg right they only see the end result yeah I, think, I mean absolutely yeah. like um I, I mean I definitely fall into the same traps to just uh you know seeing things online and not understanding people's journey and like what they had to yeah. go through to get in that way whether it's body or the art and um, I mean yeah. definitely people like message me like I don't understand how you you know, do these born ups and stuff, and mm. and um, yeah, I mean, it's just just working through consistently. But you know, I, and addressing something that you said earlier on, you know, um, mm. even though I did get that negative comment, and mm. you know, it is really easy to get wrapped up around you know the internet and get yeah. get bothered by like just mean people. Like, of course, the the majority of art, like I I'd say like ninety you know 95 percent, maybe not 98 even percent right. of people who love art who does art like are really mm-hmm. nice people in general like they just most people just want to get re, you know get better at art and they also want to support people who right. are um, you know uh, good at art and um there's no yeah. point to just hating you know there, there are some people who are just angry and they just yeah. want to vent and i like to like 
even though that guy like said the the, the weird thing about my like artwork and stuff um mm. i didn't you know i i didn't really feel sad or angry but i was just more shocked like it's like i was just thinking yeah. more along the lines like why would someone like this person must be having like a bad day there must be some sort of like you know sadness or something yeah. going on in his head for him just to, to lash out something. yeah just to lash out on someone who they don't even know it just seems like such yeah. a weird thing to do um I, yeah i think it's just even sometimes when people are perhaps on their journey for art as well and they feel like because they can't do it or aren't at the level yet where they feel they're making stuff productively they want to then tear down the person next to them so they're like oh well you know you know you're only using a filter so they're like it makes them feel better about their art like oh they couldn't have possibly done that by hand they couldn't have possibly you know rendered that with their own brush or you know they have to have cheated because i can't do that yet so mm. how can they do that but then when you, you know what people a... said that about uh people who did the background art for uh spider-verse which was you know spider-verse what? is just like an entire different category of course but Jesus. like the people are saying like oh you know this is an art they the what did they say they said something along the lines like oh they just put like a cool filter over it and that's all <sighs> they did and i was like are you insane like uh, I, just, I know yeah. that that you know, film it's... is like one of the greatest works of art like we just we just don't deserve films like that because like <laughs> the many people i know that went to see that and then i was like oh what did you think of it and they're like eh it was all right and i'm like oh my god oh, oh no Christ. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about but it's like uh i mean uh uh when we went to when was it was the last time i went to and uh bastian was was showing some of his stuff off that he worked with mm -hmm. um with his partner on the, on the studio stuff and mm -hmm. It was just like, oh my god, like such amazing concepts and and Viz Dev, and then that movie came out, and it was just like it blew. But I think it was because people had this preconception of animated films, right? That like either they're for kids or mm -hmm. like you know, there's not as much money goes into it as normal films, which is also true. Yeah. But then you know, there's this whole stigma with it. But then I remember watching that thing from start to finish, and I was like, oh my. God, yeah, I was what? blown away by it. It was the animation amazing, style, yeah. the rendering, the oh god, am I in? You know, and it's hard to, when people, you know, you're trying to obviously fill in the blanks about how they're achieving these effects and mm -hmm. whether they're getting the idea and like, yeah, but it's 3D, but it's mixed with a 2D effect, so it looks like it's 2D. And um, even like claws, you know, like right. there was always a close, I remember I can't say the word, but when that, I mean, that getting teased by one of the ADs in that project years ago when they just made like a three minute, you know, uh, kind of proof of concept thing. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Guy. But then uh, to see that finally now, and and thank God it won, you know, a lot of awards. I was actually kind of mm -hmm. uh, gutted that it didn't win more at the Oscars. I yeah, the, well, maybe. the Oscars is a bit. Well, of course, yeah, because we know what the Oscars are. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like I feel like there really should be a a, a a more emphasis on a lot of these animated films and features getting more awards and more recognition because some of the stuff that's came out the last couple of years and it's just been, you know, mind blown. I mean, Spider-Verse, we're getting a sequel for it, thank God. But yeah. um, I think even then when they done that at the box office, it didn't do, it done well, but it didn't do like, like exceedingly well. It didn't make like a lot of right. money back. Um, but then I think it made enough. They were like, well, we can justify making a sequel. So, um, but yeah, people don't deserve those films because they're just, they're so well executed and done. And, <laughs> well, you know, people will watch them and then come back in and like, ah, it was all right. Yeah, it was fine. It was a Spider-Man film, you know. Yeah. So, um, well, yeah. it's just part of the the whole superhero. What people were saying, like superhero fatigue. I mean, I'm, yeah. you know, I I'm just like, you know, I'm just the idiot who goes to every superhero film, just because. No, I'm, but I mean, I'm like a good idiot, my, my type idiot, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then, I mean, like even my parents, I know sometimes I tried to get them watch stuff like Endgame, and they're still in this the way of like, I oh, know, you know, it's comic books, it's for kids. Yeah. But then the way I actually converted them was um, because my my parents, well, my dad's especially, but my parents both love the jason bourne films right right um, so i got them to watch the captain america stuff um because they're pretty much like on par with like what bourne is doing you know mm -hmm. like even um the the second one is a winter soldier yeah um and uh and especially even the first one because my dad loves war films so i was like oh yeah you would love this you know because it takes place in second world war and, mm -hmm. and then the second one was like you know it was like jason bourne and mm -hmm. so like that then entered them into the because they were like oh well what else can we watch and then they heard from people like oh thor's really funny like the latest thor was really good so they watched uh ragnarok and then right. they went to go back and watch the other ones so i think it has crossed that barrier of like trying to explain to people that the marvel cinematic universe and even dc is no longer for kids like that is very of 
the way that you know people that grow up watching this stuff but now they're all adults are like my age so they want the the more pg no the pg the 18 rated stuff so like that's why you know like deadpool was so successful because of like it crossed that barrier into like an adult comic book film right so um and i think it's the same with games right like games also now are crossing that barrier where people want to see grittier realer harsher stuff or things that are less handholdy and let you just kind of take the reins it's the reason why i think zelda done so well because yeah, it was course. more like just letting you go and explore and be yourself and no holding your hand every two seconds or having a fairy yelling your ear listen listen every two seconds so um but yeah then i think that's also great with with uh the way arts evolved as well because you all have seen the full arc right from coming as an intern at opaz and then like yeah. looking at how concept art sits now in the industry like i suppose what's your biggest takeaway from that timeline do you feel like now almost like the production side you're doing now is is more like in line with films is, and then what it used to be more um i'm trying i don't know i'm trying to think what i'm trying to say but with games especially i think there was a time when games wasn't taken seriously either and then like, uh, I, I, I think i understand what you mean i, I yeah, think yeah. um you know i i think both games and uh like games and video games and even tv series they mm-hmm. uh, they, they both influence one another like to right. be honest like um you know like especially games like uh was it last of us and uh, yeah. god of war they're very story driven and they're almost to a degree where they're almost like cinematic could be cinematic stories to an extent yes. and um you know and there's a lot of like you know there's a lot of films being made like ready player one was an example where they're trying yeah. to bridge that video game gap um, yeah. course, i mean they, they've been doing it for ages they, they've done those like awful like 80s 90 films like was it the mario brothers or uh, street oh, fighter yeah, movies yeah. i mean i, I love them because they're yeah, so yeah. goofy but they are um, amazing i mean yeah. they've been doing stuff like that for ages to be honest and yeah um, and even tv it, series yeah. like was it um was it uh picard uh i think red letter media actually talked about it is that they, they oh, pretty yeah. much stole like the whole premise of like mass effect free which is the worst mass effect effect of course i was gonna say yeah, yeah. two is my favorite so yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I think it's the way that things have evolved and uh, just being um, like the art form being seen as a serious medium. I mean, even when back in the day I watched um, Avatar The Last Airbender, like yeah. for the first time. And I mean, I've got Ang tattooed on my arm now, but like that TV show was probably very meant for kids, but there was so much adult themes in it, you know, right, like right. death, sacrifice, friendship, loyalty, you know, honor, all that kind of stuff was just like, it was, it, you know, for a lot of people, I think, growing up in the 90s and 2000s, like, TV and media raised them. It taught them right from right. wrong. And I think with stuff like Avatar, you know, people would look at it as though it was for kids, but it was a very, uh, in parts, it was a very adult show. And, right. uh, yeah, because people, like, people die in it. And he's got, you know, he's got, he's got to kill the Emperor at the end, and he's like, oh, no, just take away his powers because, you know, I've got a high moral code. I think even part of the reason, you know, eventually when I went vegetarian was because Aang was vegetarian. So it was right. like... Yeah, a lot of these these shows now are, are are growing up and and finding their own voice. And I think you know films have you know had a long history where you know they've been around since you know the early nineteen hundreds, even before that. Um, but games, especially and maybe even like animated shows, are very very young. So I think that's why you know now we're only getting to a point where people are starting to maybe pay attention because um, Marvel, especially, have been mm-hmm. like at the forefront of that, which is good and bad because I mean I don't good. know. I mean like yeah. you know in Japan, for example, like. Uh, you know, Studio Ghibli oh, yeah. has always Ghibli, been a... yeah, anime's always been a huge but then I think, right. I mean like Western media getting, you know, adult now and, and taking stuff seriously, I mean I know in the East, things like that have been taken seriously for a long, long time mm-hmm. um, I think there was even, we were having this conversation the other day about there's there's so many martial artists and bodybuilders in the world that were influenced by Dragon Ball Z yeah, <laughs> of course <laughs> I mean, so, I mean like Goku and Vegeta were ripped, so I mean like you were always like, ah, oh, I really want to be like that or I want to learn martial arts, so mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like that. I mean, I wanted to be a Power Ranger. But, like, I took up tricking and martial arts because I thought I could be one of the uh, stunt people for the Power Rangers. Oh, for Power and, Rangers. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This no. <laughs> is such a stupid goal, but. Uh, no, yeah. but that's. Cool. <laughs> like, uh, no, I love the fact. I've never actually thought about tricking for a while because I remember the last time I was kind of looking at it was uh, when Sean was uh, putting up a. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. yeah. He's crazy good. Yeah, but um, and also Scottish way. Um, yeah, yeah the, the Power Ranger stuff like it's funny to see even some of the like the guy who plays the Green Ranger, the guy who was played Tommy years oh, yeah, ago. Yeah, Tommy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's like he's still doing appearances. He's still doing like cameos, and oh man, like that stuff is. And then it was funny because uh, I actually get some really awesome jewelry from 
uh, a place called Han Cholo, and they make um, like custom, <laughs> like ri- yeah, they make like rings and necklaces that are based on pop culture stuff. Yeah, and they've just recently done a Power Rangers line, oh, so nice. you can get like a mini like Morpher thing as a ring, or like the the White Rangers helmet as a ring as well, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, like a lot of that stuff is is still today like very very in the media's eyes, and people are still thinking about stuff like Power Rangers. But yeah, it's like there's so much influence i think from the east that's now came into the west and you look at even stuff like you know like riot games specifically or play you know even blizzard back in the day but then they were very heavily i think influenced now from a lot of eastern styles of drawing and Mm -hmm. um people doing art and that style and it's very you know it looks like a western thing now but it is still very much i think influenced from there um even back in the day when i remember like alvin lee you know doing some a lot of the early stuff with marvel and then he eventually moved to riot like he influenced a lot of their their splash uh screen stuff and so yeah, like there's been a whole transition of East meets West, and mm-hmm. and and uh, yeah, is that something that you've always tried to? I mean, you talked about you know early on in your career you were wanting to even draw manga, and you said you have a friend also that um is working with toy animation. Right, right. Is that like something eventually you would want to maybe try and like maybe go work that side of the world? Or? Man, I would I would love to work in like you know toy animation or like a Japanese right. company. Yeah, um, it's it's still a go, but to be honest, mm-hmm. I I suck so bad at inking oh, and. You're and too hard manga yourself, style, man. so I'm like, oh man, that's like a whole new thing to learn. Maybe that'll be yeah, my yeah, new yeah. warm, uh, like morn up or warm War, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've seen people doing. Um, one of my friends in Glasgow at the moment, he's trying to learn, uh, just to get better drawn. And he's trying to do one comic every day, even yeah. if it's like a really short one. He's trying to just make something every day. Um, so that could that could be a thing. I know when I was at THU, I managed to meet uh Shuvo, um, who is the ceo at polygon pictures in yep. tokyo mm-hmm. and they're always looking for talented people so yeah it would definitely be a thing like if you just chapped on the door at one point or got in touch with them i think you would definitely um be interested in doing some projects but then i think a lot of their stuff is on site so it would be like you probably have to go and live in tokyo um, maybe i wouldn't mind i'm still young nah, I'm not either, man. <laughs> at this point i'm quite happy to go so um yeah. so yeah it was i think it was the same where um even i was over at california for lightbox um like LA is cool and like getting to see Riot Games and Blizzard it was really mm-hmm. awesome to go visit those places but um, I'm still not 100% if I'd want to live in California Did you book because... for a lightbox already? Disaster? No, no, I, I went last year so okay. um, I managed to get a, a pass off Raf um, to go and like help him at his table while he yeah. was doing stuff um, but then when I was out there like people knew I was out so like David Long got in touch and he was like nice. do you want to come see Blizzard and then I knew like all oh, my friends at Riot just now she's working on the the recently announced fps game oh, awesome. so um she's she was there as an environment artist she's like oh yeah if you pop by riot like i can give you a tour so i went and saw riot um so like yeah the, really awesome studios really amazing stuff but then i'm like to live in la i mean it, i think the if you have enough money and you can get to a nice area it would be fine but then i think the thing that shocked me most about los angeles was just like the homeless population like the homeless oh yeah they got like crazy homeless towns out there oh man it was we were driving by i think one morning to go to the pasadena to the convention center mm-hmm. and you were passing parks where like like you know like 10 15 people were like washing themselves in the lake and yeah it's, it's pretty was, sad to be honest it's crazy man but it's because there's like there's such a huge concentration of people in one place um and you know you see even when you drive down like the 401 and stuff like there's whole shanty towns set up on the underpasses with people living in tents and Mm -hmm. um basically that's their home and and it's it's crazy so i think it would be great to maybe like you know when people have got the opportunity like heath you know to work for riot like remotely you know still live in london but he gets to work on you know riot splash art and stuff and then also magic the gathering so i think that's like the ultimate is that you find somewhere you like to live but then you can still get to work with all these great studios Um, right right so yeah and is that something that's also in the cars for you at one point are you looking towards like you would love to eventually maybe do stuff like magic or, or riot or yeah I, I totally um uh would love to um you know work for like magic and riot and right. stuff in the future yeah. um yeah i mean especially magic cards like it's uh you know it dominates so much like aspect of my life i spend so much money on cards <laughs> like i i and the, the worst thing about being freelance is that uh-huh. i i don't hang out with people as much as i should okay so right, i'm just yeah. hoarding all these like new sets just like oh. in my room and i'm just like deck building uh, i mostly play like was it like commander which is like a four oh, yeah. like a four person format yeah and i just got all these cards and i'm like <laughs> yeah so, <laughs> so it's just i don't even know why i, I have so much cards. 
<laughs> but then I think it's easy as well because now you live kind of relatively close to London, so you right. probably. I mean, do you still like see a lot of the guys from Opaz now and again? Or uh, yeah, I tried to. You know, they're oh. they're also like successful and like, yeah, and have the just stuff. working all the time. So like, I, I yeah. you know, it's hard to meet them up. All the time. Yeah. Of course, yeah. But then I think that's good why we have things like Discord communities and you know streaming and all that kind of stuff. And I think the last couple of times I've seen, you know, Heathdraw was yeah. when he was doing his entry for the Art War stuff mm-hmm. when he done the you know the shark with the, yeah yeah the, yeah. So it was great watching them do that kind of stuff. So, but then again, because without Twitch, you wouldn't have got to see that process. But it was really awesome just to sit and watch them draw every day. And it was also good because I could put them in the background of my monitor. And then just when I was sitting drawing stuff, you know, I was having them in the background was inspiring me. You know, we drawing stuff. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's just I think magic and all this stuff is like the ultimate. And again, because yeah, I play magic as well, I really need yeah. to get my girlfriend in it at one point because yeah, I can't just keep playing. Yeah, magic. I've been trying to get my wife into it, and she just zones <laughs> out like. This this is like what would you call it a, a thousand yard stare? She just like oh yeah, she's yeah. like what, what are you talking about, you nerd? I'm yeah, just she's like, like oh, mana, man. hills, mountains. What what's going on I here? Like, so, what are you doing? <laughs> um, yeah, man. So I mean, like, so you've got these projects on the go. You're doing your your freelance thing, um, and then you know moving down into the future, you're looking towards you know you'd love to do move across or work in Japan or do stuff for Riot. Yeah. Um, what are your kind of interests that are keeping you sane outside of your art? I mean, I know you're talking about, you know, martial arts is like a huge part of your life. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there anything else on top of that? Or oh man, um, yeah, aside stuff. from art and martial arts, uh, yeah, I mean, I love watching uh, like mar- like fights, like the boxing and MMA and kickboxing okay, yeah. and Muay Thai. Right. Uh, magic cards really do <laughs> occupy a lot of my time because I'm always just like. Uh, you know, was it the Command Zone podcast or something like that? I'm just oh, always right, okay. trying to learn like what the next best deck is or the new card set and stuff. Right. Um, I guess I guess like comic books and uh, right. books and stuff in general. I I recently, you know, I'm a big fan of like Batman comics, so I try my best to like keep up with the series. Cool. And uh, recently read a book called um, Was it I'll Be Gone in the Dark, which is about uh, was it the what they call him the the uh, Golden State Killer, which is oh, okay, uh, which or Golden Bridge? No, yeah, Golden State Killer, and it's just um, yeah, it's a pretty gnarly book, but it's really well nice. written. So, cool, cool. Yeah. So that's your kind of. Uh, do you do the kind of the whole self motivation thing as well? Is there any kind of like um, what they call power books? Is there anything you're kind of reading? Just I mean, I know like for me, I'm I'm just about to start reading, or I have been reading like the first chapter of um, Cal Newport's Deep Work. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Uh, no, I haven't heard of it. I'll need to pass that on to you. It's a really good one. Okay. It's all it's all about the guy's he's like a like a thesis PhD professor, like a really, really high end, you know, academic and he's wrote this book called Deep this Deep Work. I think it's Deep mm-hmm. Work. And it's all about how uh focus concentration can produce some like amazing results. And he talks yeah. about like, you know, completely like cutting himself off from the world, um, and just focus on solely on one task all the time. And that's mm-hmm. how he's found that he's been like so successful and other people he's seen who have done you know multiple papers on research every year or have produced like amazing books and other things it's because you know they almost like cut themselves off from society at one point or like you know seclude themselves to cabins in the woods and make sure that they're only you know writing with a, an old style typewriter like there's no electronic um because i feel like that's the balance right is that there's there's so many distractions now mm-hmm. you know especially when you're freelance like you're like oh i can just like fire up call of duty or something or right. i can like oh, i can sit and play you know magic online or whatever but like the the distractions is something that i think we fight against every mm-hmm. day and i think deep work is a very good um a very good book all about that struggle and how to I overcome see. it okay so, yeah, um yeah. yeah i i mean i mean i mean that's one of the things i thought going freelance i'd have plenty of time to play like video games when the witcher game came out no witcher oh, yeah. uh, tv series came out i thought like yeah. i play more witcher 3 or uh, you know, it was like with the new Animal Crossing coming out for play like Animal Crossing. I hadn't even oh, yeah. had any time to play any games. I've just been like working consistently so and bad, keeping things that like you know keep the house from falling apart. But, yeah, you know, basically. Just, yeah, it's just you know. Um, I think, I think it's also because when you're freelance, it's also because yeah. you don't want to say naughty stuff, right? You're just kind of saying yes to everything. Yeah, kind of. At the moment, I I do sort of do that i'm getting a bit better about not saying mm-hmm. yes to everything um, right just because i do want time for myself yourself yeah 
Um, but it's hard though as well because if a good opportunity comes along, even though if it's amazing, you're still having to be like, oh, do I really, do I really need to take it? I, I don't know. I mean, I, it just depends on like again. It's, this goes back to just writing like a good timetable for yourself. Like if mm-hmm. you have a set timetable in your diary or whatnot, um, or your yeah. calendar. Um, yeah. If you know like how many hours you're supposed to spend on each project each week, and you know that there's possibility of there being enough time to take on another project, right? Like, you know, I'm I'm very like, I try to be as transparent as possible to my clients to say, yeah, you know, I I am working with like other clients. Like, are you happy with me? You know, doing a certain amount of hours or amount of days, right. yeah, on your project. And most of them are pretty understanding. Will like usually, you know, come to like middle ground and. Yeah, uh, and if you really like the project, you know, sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. But uh, yeah, yeah, and um, it's all about timing. I think, and I'd like to say, as long as you're being the keyword there, transparent. You know, yeah. as long as you're being very open, that like, look, I've got work on, and there's things going on, but then I, I do want to work with you. So I mean, maybe we could find the middle ground. So I think most companies that are decent, you know, will be like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, we can work something out. Yeah. So. Um, but then it's, I mean, it's good also because then it depends on the production line because you may have like a couple of months to finish something or a couple of weeks. So, um, you can always like say if you're scheduling properly using a calendar, you can be like, oh, well, I've got a gap here or, you know, I've got something coming yeah. up that's kind of finishing so I can take this on. Um, yeah. I mean, so, the yeah. worst thing to do is just, you know, take on the client and then, you know, then suddenly messaging their production manager saying like, oh, I can't, I can't do this work. I can't finish I, it. I can't finish yeah. it. I'm really sorry. I'm way behind schedule. That's the worst thing to do, you know, I, and I, yeah. that hasn't happened to me yet, but I, yeah. you know, I try not to have things like that happen. I mean, like, you know, of course, you know, maybe there's the family circumstances or things pop up with health reasons uh, right, I mean, yeah. that, that could, but like, again, transparency helps. Like, yeah, um, you, you just got to let people know, like, you, you can't just be like taking all the jobs and then, yeah, and then not delivering. That's just, just, of course. just a really bad PR move on your side I think so a lot of companies are very aware that you know they have to start treating their employees like they're human beings and right. of course every human has times when you know you're sick or you're tied up for something or something's mm-hmm. happened where you know you've not thought about it last minute and you need to do something else so yeah i think as long as there's no consistency in that also as long as you're not consistently saying to people oh, i'll take work on but then consistently being like oh i can't finish it so um i think that's the thing we talked about not too long ago even with alex where um something I, I never really understood in this industry but then i think it was just part of me just not being as professional as i could be but it was also mm-hmm. like completing a task but you know making sure that you're putting your everything into that task like you're making sure that like you're proud of that work and you're you're finishing it to the best of your ability you're not just like oh that's good enough or that'll do or you know oh, well, it's only a such and such 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 so i don't need to actually put any effort and you know as long as you're going to in a uh a mindset when you're working with people is that everything you're producing is like something you are proud of like you're like yeah. oh i'm proud i worked on that that piece was really good i really tried my hardest um i think as long as that's the consistency and as long as mm-hmm. you're making sure that that is your uh or the thing you are maybe known for most is that you are professional you will do things to the best of your ability yeah yeah um i think that's all people can really ask for on the end you can't really ask much more so um yeah definitely of um cool man so i've um I've kept you away for long enough. You probably got um things you want to do this weekend. Although, I'd, yeah, no worries. With, with, with the way London's locked down, I don't know if you'll be doing uh much. But then I suppose you might even go for a walk or how how is it there only just now? Are you still able to get out of the house and yeah, of, of course. Shop? Like the the news makes it sound like you know London's just like absolute so chaos. People <laughs> put up like boarded up their windows and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, Shaun it, of the dead kind of thing. I mean, the only thing that's happened is like you know their supermarkets are all like. Pretty, like the at least the large ones are all like wiped out like i have a local right. sainsbury's and it's just like you can't buy anything you buy like window yeah. cleaner and and uh, a pack of cookies maybe oh. i mean i don't know if you can survive on just that, don't but... confuse those two things <laughs> <laughs> yeah man no that's fine no again hopefully you know we'll see how this goes on and it'll be funny maybe looking back and a year from now I'll set this podcast thinking oh god that was an interesting time eh? but um but yeah so uh thanks for coming on and speaking to us henry it yeah was, uh, no worries was really oh, actually can i say something yeah of course you know, just before I go um yeah so I, I mean i know if if anyone uh, even wants to listen to me talk uh, on this podcast I, and you got this far um yeah you know like since we're all in lockdown and the coronavirus and a lot of you know most artists work at home now um if you know in most studios they're even encouraging yeah. to work at home um, mm. Yeah, try to reach out to all your friends and 
you know, mm-hmm. uh, especially your art friends in particular and you know mm-hmm. tr- try to keep everyone from going crazy you know try to support everyone at this time you know share share their artwork online some people might have lost their jobs around this time especially artists so make sure you like share people's artworks on social media try to promote your friends and stuff and, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah there's a there's a hashtag going about on a uh, instagram at the moment i think it's artists supporting artists and it's oh, yeah, where yeah, yeah, yeah. tag like a bunch of artists and then somebody else tags a bunch of artists so mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's one of these things in the darkest times. I know even like, you know, um, you know, the at the time of this recording it'll be fine because they haven't announced it. Uh Kit Bash are giving away um one of the Utopia kits for free because oh, they yeah. want people want people to use that Utopia kit to make something like a uh uh what's the word? Like a bright version of the future, you know, like something yeah. really nice mm-hmm. um and share it and they're gonna try and uh retweet or or you know, repost as much of the the artworks that people make as they can so um, that's also an opportunity to help people and come together as a community and and yeah you're right like um one of my my friends literally yesterday messaged me saying that she'd lost her job because of the, the virus so oh, man um yeah she was she just started at a, uh an arch fish place in, in edinburgh and yeah they, they kind of just said straight away that they, they need to let her go because of the, the projects and stuff but yeah it's, it's a shame so i think it is definitely you're right henry that in this darkest time we need to try and come together and make sure that we're all helping each other um i know there's a few things going on people are giving away a lot of stuff for free or they're you know they're offering discounts so if you keep an eye on a lot of your emails and artists you you follow a lot of guys have been posting stuff up that um they've been you know happy to give things away for free i think uh the major one is aaron blaze uh is mm-hmm. actually giving away his intro to character animation for free oh, wow. like the whole course okay. um which is a big deal so yeah, yeah if you guys want to grab that i'll maybe even put that link in the description and of course, I'll put all Henry's social media down in the bottom. Um, you guys can reach out to him. He's always super helpful to to uh, talk to you guys or, or help you out with stuff. So um, just, you know, send him an email or a message. And of course, be polite and really nice. But um, I'm sure Henry will, if he's not busy, get back to you and, and help you with uh, anything you're wanting to talk about. So, yeah, that's awesome. Um, okay, again, yeah, thanks again to the Henry for coming on. Uh, thank um, you thank you for having me on (laughs) yeah you're welcome man um if you guys have any questions or anything you want to ask henry just put it down below again i'll leave all his socials in the descriptions um check us out on spotify google Podcasts, um youtube loads and loads of variations of where you can find us um and yeah we will speak to you guys later Bye. bye